Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to part 21. This is Paleocrat Diaries, and I'm your host, Jake Fowler, here on The Meaning of Catholic. It's coffee time. It's early. It's not that early. It's not as early as as the morning show, but, you know, this is the time I could get this week. It's been a little hectic. Our Lady's Closet, by the way, is bumping. you got to check this thing out. Follow my wife, Instagram, Facebook. You can be notified of anytime she makes an update, uh, adds a dress, chooses a new style, etc., etc. That's the reason, not to... Not to blame her by any means, but that's the reason why it's been so long because, my goodness, these dresses are so amazing. People want them, and they order them, and then she makes them, and that takes time. And that takes time. So there you have it. This is, as it were, the grand finale of the Ecumenical Council's Season 1. Right? We're not, not going to call it Season 1, but... We've looked at, from Nicaea 1 up until now, this will be Constantinople 4. So this is the 8th ecumenical in the West. And what have we seen? Well, it's been over 500 years of intrigue, turmoil, murder, adultery, heresy, crisis. Crisis in the church. And that's the point. That's the point. When we look back into history and we see all of these crazy things, then we compare it to our situation now when we see lots and lots of crazy things. Things that, that make your hair stand on end. And you want to say, mm, I don't know about that. Take heart. Because we've been through it. The church has been through it. And that's just the way it is. So, we should, we should wrap up. We should wrap up this segment. Oh, that was quick. Instead of a slow fade out, my mouse slipped and there it went. Okay, so over to the outline. Here we are. So we were right on the verge of Constantinople IV, summoned by Emperor Basil II with the approval of Hadrian, the, excuse me, Basil I, Basil the Macedonian, with the approval of Pope Hadrian II. So in June of 869, the legates travel to the capital city, the Roman legates. They, they're dispatched by the Pope with certain instructions. Uh, I think we covered these in part 20. If you need to refresh your memory, go back and check out the ending there. They opened the council in October with only about a dozen bishops. Why would that be? I mean, this was meant to be an ecumenical council. The emperor wants all kinds of people here. We've got a lot of things to celebrate or, or to, uh, to, to make you know, official, you know, kind of ratify. Well, the reason there were only about 12 bishops has to do with the fact that Hadrian II had disallowed anyone who was consecrated by Photius. So he was patriarch for like 10 years. And back then, you know, bishop consecrations nowadays are fairly infrequent. I'm not exactly sure the frequency in those days over 1,200 years ago, or nearly 1,200 years ago, but I have to imagine that it was more than it is now. So this automatically rules out a bunch of people who otherwise would have attended this council called by Basil I. So the first four sessions uh, began October 5th, that was the first session, and these first four sessions pretty much spent their time deciding who among the bishops who arrived would be eligible to participate. So remember, there were these three conditions. If you were already a bishop but you sided with Photius, then if you apologized and said you wouldn't do that again, then you could be allowed to, to participate. If you were a bishop uh, who was a priest and then consecrated by Photius. Mm, I don't know, you were already a priest first, but he made you a bishop and your allegiances are clearly with him. And then if you were just straight up a Photian, like, no, goodbye, we're not having that here. So, those who were more on his side were pretty well excluded from Constantinople IV. 
those who wanted to repent, as it were, were asked to sign a certain formula. This is the formula of Hormizdus, drawn up in the early 500s. This is what reconciled and he- uh, excuse me, healed the Acacian schism. So here we are again. The Pope is presenting to Constantinople, right, to the bishops and the patriarch there. Here, here's what you have to do. You got to sign this, saying that what you did was bad, and I'm in charge. It doesn't really say that, but kind of, kind of does say that. So the fifth, sixth, and seventh session of the council. These were held between November 5th and 7th, so 5, 6, 7, boom, boom, boom. These were devoted to the trial, as it were, of Photius. Now, the papal legates, they actually objected to this trial. They said, wait a minute, the ruling's already been made. Uh, Hadrian has already held the synod. We don't need to do this, right? Nicholas held the synod. Hadrian confirmed and and said the same exact thing. Look, here's our letter of instruction. So we really don't need a trial where he's going to show up and then we have to defend and present evidence. It's kind of a mess. Can't we just skip straight to the condemnation? Because remember what we said? Basil agreed to this. You all agreed to this. Well, there were some folks who maybe changed their mind a little bit. The imperial officials insisted that Photius have his day in court, as it were. So he was summoned to appear before the council. They questioned him. They said, well, remember when you condemned and excommunicated Pope Nicholas I? What do you have to say for yourself? Hey, remember when you condemned all of these Latin practices that are really just customs that in their own right are entirely harmless. They're different from yours, but mm, remember that. Oh, remember the time you... And they just kept going, 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 going. And what do you have to say for yourself, Photius? That's what he had to say for himself. Absolutely nothing. He remained silent. The only responses he gave were in imitation of our Lord. He remarked about being tried unjustly. It, uh, in our, our Lord's trial before Pilate, I should have been more specific. One is tempted to admire in Photius a certain amount of courage and steadfastness. Uh, and indeed, he seems to have been, for all of his faults, a man of great virtue, great learning, and, and probably great faith as well. But he was pretty much silent before his accusers, and since his accusers were pretty much also his judges, he was summarily condemned, deposed, and excommunicated according to Hadrian's prior decision. So we spent three days talking about all the stuff that Photius did, and he's just sitting there. And then at the end of it, it's the same as it was before. You're still condemned. You're still deposed. You're still excommunicated. He refused, naturally, to acknowledge this sentence, But Basil and the imperial guard forced him into exile. Now, some who were sympathetic to Photius, they protested the legates, and they offered some words in Photius's defense. Their argument sort of went something like this. History showed that popes had sometimes erred evidenced by the fact that later decisions were sometimes revoked. Uh, Popes were not above canon law. Therefore, Hadrian's decisions need not stand. Ergo, bring him back and let's try this again. The legates again objected to this. It's an unnecessary distraction, not to mention it's false. They stood firm, and the other bishops had to yield. Remember, it was Basil who suggested this to Hadrian. Basil, uh, he's tired of Photius. Photius was was put in place, recall, by Caesar Bardas, right? Uncle Bardas, Michael the Drunkard's uncle. And Basil and Photius, it seems, never did really get along very well. 
So when Basil killed Michael the Third, or had him killed, and wants to kind of clean house, right? So uh, when political turnover, like in the United States, for example, when uh, Joseph Biden took office, Trump's officials are gone, and we're going to bring in our guys now. Same kind of thing. Basil's in, Michael the Third, all the people he appointed, all of his buddies in this or that slot. You have to go. And Photius, you're one of them. So thanks for your service. Goodbye. And we're going to bring Ignatius back. Right? So Photius and his supporters, they don't really stand a chance at Constantinople for 869. The reason I say it like that, well, it will become clear momentarily. So the will of Hadrian II is executed regarding Photius and his supporters. And the following week, so this would be the second week in November, 869, a solemn bonfire is held within which the writings of Photius and his anti-papal council of 867 are burned to a crisp. Part of me is like, yeah. And the other part is like, no, because we could have used those documents nowadays when we're writing our books and things. We want to see, well, what did he actually say? Do we have an accurate account that comes down through history? What about the acts of this synod? I mean, I'm sure it was very interesting. Hmm. So, it's a little... Hmm. All right. So, after eight sessions of Constantinople IV in the year 869, the work of the council is done. Remember, this wasn't exactly a doctrinal council. This isn't a dogmatic kind of thing. Now, they, they do anathematize a certain heresy, and we'll get to that. But for the most part, it was a disciplinary council, uh, a council convened to, you know, what about this Photius guy? What about Ignatius? What are we going to do about this situation in the East? So the work's done. And now all that remains is to kind of put this reality into shape in the form of canons. Except between the 8th and the ninth session, there's this mysterious interval of three months, a little over three months, actually. Why? It's not clear. Perhaps negotiations ensued regarding the canons to be promulgated, and what specifically to do about Photius. Perhaps due to the inflexibility of the legates, in fact, a certain one in particular, a man named Marinus. He was a future pope, by the way. He sort of, well, he was very firm. He wanted to stick by the letter of what Hadrian said. And Basil, I think, expected some leniency. So Marinus and Basil... They didn't get along so well, and sources say that Marina sort of ran afoul of the emperor, was even put in prison for a time. So we have arguments over, well, possibly over the canon, over Photius, and then you've got this personal dispute between the emperor and one of the Roman legates. In fact, he was the chief legate. So there's this gap of about three months. Whatever the reason... And it could be none of the above. It might be something else altogether. The ninth session didn't meet until February of 870. Now, I mentioned the substantial work is done. And so the last task of the council is to sort of issue this formal set of canons. And there were 27 of them. And this was happening February 28th. 870. So they met uh, for a ninth session, and then I believe this would be the tenth session. Now, if only it were just simple. It can't just be simple. You see, the Latin version of the canons and the Greek version of the canons are not entirely the same. The Latin one has 13 more that the Greek one doesn't have. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that either the Latins or the Greeks falsified the record. Evidently, the Greek originals were lost, and only 14 of them survive as copies in some form. So we have what we believe is the complete list in the Latin version, 
and then a partial list in the Greek version. And to be clear, all the ones that we have in the Greek version do appear in the Latin version. So it's not as if this one has a, a canon that the other one couldn't have had. Okay. Most of them are mundane, so I won't bore you. But a few of them are worthy of mention. So canon 11 in the Latin edition, canon, it's, it's canon 10 in the Greek uh, record, speaks of the uniqueness of human souls. This is the heresy that was condemned. So apparently there were these guys running around saying, you know, I think human beings have two souls. And it caught the attention of the council fathers, and they condemned it in no uncertain language. So, folks, don't say that. You can't do that. You have one soul, right? Secondly, canon number 12. Now, the Greek one for this is lost. So the, Ro the, the, the Roman, the Latin version of it is something like, there ought to be no participation by secular rulers in any Episcopal appointments. No princes or lay authorities may take part in any way. Hmm. So it's sort of like the 8th General Council, way back in the 800s, is already addressing the investiture controversy that we will see in the West in the coming centuries. Now, this also indicates to us that this was already going on. Uh, I wonder, who was the last one to really do this, to make a big wave? Hmm, maybe it was Vardas when he put Photius onto the throne. Oh, no, but there was the time when Tarasius, because he was a layman. Hmm, seems to be a theme in the East. I don't know. Yikes. Canon 21, moving on, which is canon 13 in the Greek record, talks about Roman primacy. And I'm going to read it. I just need to snatch it. Here's my Denzinger right there. Okay, so if you have this edition... Number 661, you can follow along. Go pause it. No, I'm kidding. Don't pause it. All right, let's see. The primacy of the Roman See. Let's see, let's see, let's see. So quoting scripture, quoting Matthew chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, whoever receives you, receive me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. It's similar in Luke. It says, we believe that the foregoing was addressed also to all those who, after them and in accordance with them, became supreme pontiffs and leaders of the pastors in the church. Leaders of the pastors. So if the priests and bishops are the pastors, who are the leaders of the pastors? Curious, it must be the Roman pontiff. We, therefore, determine that absolutely none of the ruling powers of this world shall dishonor or attempt to remove from his throne any of those who occupy patriarchal seas. Okay, so we're broadening the pool a little bit. But they must judge them worthy of all reverence and honor, especially the most holy pope of elder Rome, and also in order of succession the patriarch of Constantinople, then indeed those of Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. No one, however, is to compose or prepare any writings or discourses against the most holy pope of elder Rome, Photius, under the pretext, as it were, of supposed crimes committed, something Photius did recently and Dioscorus did much earlier. But whoever, like Photius and Dioscorus, will manifest such insolence and audacity that he promotes injuries of some sort against the see of Peter, the chief of the apostles, whether in writing or not, let him receive a condemnation equal and identical to theirs. It goes on, but I think I'll stop. You get the point. East and West, East and West recognize Rome is different. Rome has a certain primacy. Now our Eastern brethren will say, sure, sure they do. It's a primacy of honor. It's not a primacy of jurisdiction. It's not supreme, immediate, and all that. I don't know. I don't know. That's a tough case for them to make. I think the Catholic ecclesiological model is much more coherent and much uh, better documented. 
But that's not why we're here. I'll refrain from that. So there's, there's three of the 27 canons, the ones that I found probably the most relevant to our discussion today. And to complicate matters, so not only do we have legates getting thrown in prison and patriarchs being deposed and we've got a Latin version and a Greek version of the canons and nobody knows what's up. We've got this mysterious three-month interval. But towards the end of the council, those Bulgarians, they reappear on the scene. Remember, in the mid-860s, Boris, the, the Khan of the Bulgars, he kind of wants to dip his toe into the waters of Christianity. In fact, he gets baptized, taking the name Michael, after his baptismal sponsor, Michael III. And then he wants some bishops. Like, I want to, I want to mission, uh, I want to evangelize my people. I want missionaries. So send me some missionaries, please, Constantinople. Well, they sent him some missionaries, but they also start coming in, like bossing him around, telling him what to do. And by the way, uh, you're going to have to listen to the patriarch, and the patriarch listens to the emperor, so you're pretty much going to have to... Wait a minute. Uh, hang on, Constantinople. Um, let me see. Yeah, hello, Rome? Hi, can you um, send me some missionaries, please? Great. So Boris is kind of playing one against the other. He's no dummy. And he sends an embassy to Constantinople for... Boris has a crucial question. To which see ought the Bulgars be responsible? To Rome or to Constantinople? Naturally, the papal legates pressed for Rome, but they were the minority. The eastern patriarchs and the eastern bishops were like, well, that makes sense. Constantinople, it's right there. Bulgaria's in the east, so why don't we just do that? Now, According to Philip Hughes, the last communication between Marinus and the Roman legates and the newly or recently installed, not newly because he was patriarch before, the recently installed Ignatius was sort of like, hey, you better not send those missionaries to Bulgaria because you know what the Pope said about that. Remember, you agreed to not do that when he agreed to reinstate you, reinstall you as patriarch. We're going to Photius out, you're in, you leave Bulgaria alone. Remember that? And uh, reportedly, Ignatius just sort of receives the letter from Marinus. And, thank you, thank you, yes, all of these things will be taken care of, yes, thank you. And just sort of gives a dismissive response, an evasion, if you will. Now, we know what happened. Constantinople, that was the final answer, not Rome. The Bulgarians were to be subject to them. News, uh, on their way home, news reached Marinus and the legates that Ignatius had consecrated, I think, 10 or 12 bishops for Boris and sent them along to Bulgaria to preach and teach and baptize etc. So despite the general success of the proceedings and the carrying out of Hadrian II's will regarding Photius, Constantinople IV ends on a fairly sour note. To add insult to injury, the papal legates were attacked by pirates on their journey home. They were, they were raided while they were sailing in the Adriatic. Now, there is some speculation, right? It's, it's believed that both the Western Emperor and His Holiness thought that this was the work of Basil I. He did it on purpose. Why would he say that? Because, well, for one, very convenient that this suddenly happened to the exact guys coming home from the council with this whole load of documents. But the documents were lost at sea. So now we have no way of knowing exactly what happened at Constantinople IV. Now, there's no concrete proof, to my knowledge, that Basil I actually coordinated this, so we're not going to lay the charge at his feet. The only reason I mention it was because I have to explain how, in fact, do we have the records for Constantinople IV. Well, you see, there was a certain ambassador, 
Anastasius Bibliothecarius, which just means the librarian. So this guy was a librarian. He was probably pretty smart reading books and all that. And he was sent by Emperor Louis II from the Frankish Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, right? Sometimes called the Christian Empire to distinguish it from the Roman Empire. This same Anastasius, who was previously an antipope, by the way, more on that in the future, he had been reconciled during the, the reign of St. Nicholas I, Nicholas the Great. So he wasn't acting out of sync with Hadrian II. Nonetheless, this guy, he, he goes as an ambassador of Louis II, and he records the whole bit. So the Latin records of, the, of Constantinople IV, we owe absolutely to Anastasius. Now, when they get home, the Roman legates, after a long journey, right, they're probably still soaking wet from their shipwreck, and they don't have any of their papers, and they're grumpy. It's the summer of 871, June or July, maybe. Upon arrival, Marinus and the other legates, they deliver their report to Hadrian I. They relayed the outcome of the council. They relayed the canons, and they relay the Bulgarian update. Now, for the most part, Hadrian was already aware because Anastasius had come back to the west before the legates. He, in fact, was not shipwrecked and attacked by pirates and so on and so on. In November of the same year, 871, the Pope wrote to Basil. So Hadrian II, writing once more to Basil I, Sort of a ratification, sort of saying like, yeah, I approve of the proceedings of the council, except he had some sharp, sharp critiques also, particularly regarding the Bulgarians. In the end, however, the work was done and the dust settled for a short time. The Bulgarian question was not settled. In December of the following year, that would be 872, I think it was the 14th, Hadrian II died. And John VIII is elected his successor. John was an elderly man, but full of energy and quite an able administrator. He had previously been archdeacon in Rome under four popes, Leo IV, Benedict III, Nicholas I, and then Hadrian II. So the guy's got experience. He's from a pretty well-known Roman family. And he's bringing to the table a lot of vigor. John tried for years to get Ignatius to uphold the promises he made prior to Constantinople IV regarding the mission territory in Bulgaria. But to no avail. Years go by. The, the, the middle years of the 870s are just ticking along. And meanwhile in the West, the Carolingian Empire, that founded by Charlemagne, is utterly disintegrating. Internecine conflict was the status quo. Brother warring against brother, backstabbing, murder, etc. It's a standard procedure, right? Standard procedure for the 800s and the 900s, and the 1000s. You get the point. Not to mention that Italy in the south is being threatened by the Mohammedans. So the protectors of the Pope, or who have been lately the protectors of the Pope, the Franks, they're too busy warring with themselves, quarreling over who gets to be emperor and who just gets to be king. And this is, again, this is due to the the Frankish model of imperial succession or royal succession where the, 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 the ruler, like let's just take Charlemagne for example. Charlemagne divided his kingdom into thirds and he was going to leave a portion of it to each of his sons. Well, two of them happened to die before they inherited it. So the kingdom passed from Charlemagne to Louis the Pious. But in situations where it didn't, uh, where, where the sons didn't predecease the father. Then you'd have usually one territory being divided up 
and then this guy's kid gets a chunk and this guy's kid gets a chunk and how many kids do you have and how many kids do you have and you see the problem it's just a further and further splintering of what was once united lands and if you think your army can beat your brother's army then you can have his stuff too and then you get both armies and then you can turn around and so it's a whole mess so the Franks are unable to help with the Mohammedans. Italy is being besieged, and they're marching on Rome. To avoid disaster and to seek military aid, John appeals to the east. Now, he's no slouch either. Remember, he's old, but he's full of energy. He also fortified Rome. Uh, he, he, he had walls built, and he even founded a naval fleet that he himself commanded. Pretty hardcore. But still, John wanted the Romans. He wanted the Roman, the, the Roman soldiers from the empire. So he sends another group of legates to Constantinople in the spring of 878, and he wants to give Ignatius an ultimatum. Either make good on your promises in Bulgaria, or you'll be summarily deposed and excommunicated. And, oh, by the way, Legates, while you're there, see if Basil will send us some troops, because the Mohammedans are kicking down our door. When the Legates arrived, they found that John's somewhat mm, aggressive letter to the patriarch Ignatius, well, it couldn't be delivered. You see, Ignatius had been dead for about a year, in fact, he had probably been dead about six months before John even wrote the letter. This is a result, naturally, of communications. And yeah, it's just kind of rough to get word back and forth, especially when you're not exactly on the best of terms over a certain Bulgarian question. So Ignatius is dead. He's been dead for a while. And who do the legates find on the patriarchal throne taking his place well naturally photius he's back photius is back from exile in fact it seems that he had been back for several years already he and ignatius had reconciled and they were old chums and they were both working with basil the first to execute the the emperor's new policy no religious fighting period and despite their differences in the past, they just put it all behind them and everything is just sunshine and rainbows. Well, the legates show up and they're like, wait, that guy again? Uh, didn't we say he could never be more than a layman? I'm pretty sure we said that. Guys, check the record. What do you do? They didn't have instructions on how to deal with Photius. They came with instructions on how to deal with Ignatius. So they have to write to Rome. They have to get, oh, what do you want us to do, Holy Father? John's in a tough spot, John the Eighth, Given the situation with the Mohammedans, given the fact that the Franks are utterly unhelpful because they just can't stop cutting each other's heads off, and the fact that Photius and Basil seem to be getting a little closer these days, there was, there was some a story I don't, I don't have this typed down, so it's all off of my memory. But there was some story about Photius possibly finding or more likely forging uh, a family tree, right? A genealogy for Basil I that showed that <gasps> miraculously this horse trainer from Macedonia who couldn't even read and didn't know his own lineage was supposedly descended from a king, the first king of Armenia or one of the kings of Armenia, and Constantine. Okay, right, sure he is. Well, maybe it's true, probably not, I don't know. Well, anyways, Basil and Photius, they're getting really close. They're, they're hanging out, right? They're chummy once more, and John needs military help. And Photius has already been the patriarch for a while, and, hmm, he didn't really have much of a choice except to play ball. Now, Basil says, well, how about we have another council, please? He probably didn't say please, actually. He wants another council. He wants to nullify the previous one uh, regarding the proceedings against Photius 
and he wants to solemnly declare, celebrate, as it were, Photius's newfound favor. Reinstate him. And John VIII gave consent for this. So here we go, Constantinople IV, take two. The condition, however, I, I, should, I should have said this first, the condition for John's acceptance was that Photius express some kind of sorrow and regret, and maybe even apologize for his brash behavior regarding the Roman See in the previous decade. Now, these conditions were not exactly fulfilled. We can overlook that, I guess. John overlooks it, so we'll overlook it. <laughs> the, the decree, actually, I'm going to skip that part. It's too confusing. All right, so here we go. Constantinople four. Take two. 383 bishops attended. That makes this non-ecumenical council, because it's not accepted in the West or the East as truly ecumenical, but this uh, synod, as it were, is one of the largest in Christian history, right? Still not as large as Chalcedon, right up there with the others. And this is occurring in the fall of 879. So now you know why you say Constantinople 869, Constantinople 879, because there are two. And depending on if you're Eastern or Western, which do you prefer? Do you prefer the one that condemned and anathematized Photius, or, or, or excommunicated him, I should say? Or do you prefer the one that rehabilitated him and nullified 869? So typically, Catholics prefer 869 and orthodox prefer 879 doesn't amount to much because it's in the past and we should celebrate it relish relish it as a matter of fact okay so here we go autumn of 879 photius presiding not the legates curious hmm. the acts of the council of 869 against him are solemnly annulled he is reinvested with the patriarchal throne and dignity he made the prescribed promises probably and he receives from john the eighth a beautiful gift patriarchal regalia it's from the holy father himself it's amazing so within a span of just under 10 years. Well, it was exactly 10 years because the council met from November 879 until March of 880. So mirroring the time frame a decade prior of Constantinople IV, part one. The legates made it home. Everything's all well and good. John confirmed the decisions. He says, I confirm and ratify everything that went on at the council except the stuff I disagree with. So the condemnation of Photius is reversed. Photius enters communion with Rome once more. And the world is at peace. But you know it won't last. This now concludes our investigation into the ecumenical councils, the first eight of them. We'll tackle the next 13 in due time. So we're going to take them in chunks. We got up through Constantinople 4. The next one is Lateran 1, 300 years later. Well, like 250 years later. So we're going to do some Lateran 1 to Lateran 5 kind of thing. Then another short break, another series will intervene. And then we'll look at Trent, Vatican 1, Vatican 2. Right? And hopefully by then, we haven't had a Vatican 3, because then I'll just be playing catch up and it'll be ridiculous. Okay. That was really amazing. I'm glad that you all were along for the ride. This has been remarkable. And there's so many things that I said that we could go over and correct and sort of, wow, well, you really should be more precise here and precise there. I welcome criticisms. I usually ignore them anyways. All right. I should go to work. I'm sure you can tell. It actually is morning, and for this time I actually am drinking coffee. We're going to end in the same way we began, 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Don't forget, folks, Our Lady's Closet on Etsy.com, Paleocrat Diaries on Patreon, Meaning of Catholic on Patreon. And until next time, never give up, keep on smiling, and memento mori.